You just open your mouth for me. Oral symptoms That's usually lovely. start with a dry mouth and sensitivity okay. to food, especially foods which are spicy or acidic. The well. Large non-healing ulcers may be found anywhere in the mouth. Other symptoms include lack of saliva, fibrosis affecting mouth movement, and secondary viral and fungal infections. And at the moment, my tongue is slightly blistered because I'm tired. Um, but my tongue can, it, it feels like it swells up, it affects my speech. Um, I've always troubled with some letters since I was unable to speak or read. I, V's and V's and things like that are quite difficult. But when my tongue's blistered, as it is at the moment, it, it makes it even more difficult for me because I can feel it all the time. And it's like the other day I had some sausage rolls with brown sauce and that was, absolute, that was a killer. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have eaten that. <laughs> the eating is probably one of the more difficult ones because that's trial and error, how you find that out. So you, you know, think, oh, fancy a bag of crisps. And suddenly you realise how salty they are and how pointy they are because they stick in bits of your mouth that hurt. Other symptoms, uh, sometimes people have eye problems, uh, people talk about hair loss, but there are multiple problems. People talk about um, sexual uh, problems due to vaginal dryness. Um, there can also be toxicity to the lung, to the liver, and to the gastrointestinal tract. In fact, nearly any organ of the body can be affected by in the chronic st stage of the disease. When the eyes are affected, the most common symptom is dryness but other symptoms include irritation or sensitivity to light from irreversible destruction of the tear ducts. So you've got bright lights in your eye now? Uh, my eyes have been more of a recent problem. Um, they get very dry and you learn a lot through all this. When your eyes are dry, you can't focus properly. Mm -hmm. So you suddenly find, I can't read the rugby scores on the telly anymore, <laughs> which is a bit sad. I have to ask someone to tell me what the score is. Uh, I don't drive because I don't think it's safe for me to drive now. If patients develop chronic graft versus host disease of the lung, this is quite a late onset of the manifestation of graft versus host disease. Um, patients will develop a, a persistent cough, they may have a wheeze, they may find that they get quite short of breath just you know, walking on the flat. Um, obviously we need to monitor patients' lung function tests and we get a baseline record pre-transplant and then we monitor them on a regular basis post-transplant. Other symptoms can include fluid in the sac surrounding the heart and lungs, which may need draining, autoimmune degenerative disease of the muscles, and altered sensation in the fingers and toes. Women may develop vaginal or vulva lesions and ulcers. They should have a biopsy to confirm GVHD if no other organs are involved. There's little evidence of chronic GVHD targeting the male genitalia. Lifelong dysfunction of the spleen occurs with chronic GVHD and antibiotics are recommended. Secondary viral and fungal infections are common in chronic GVHD and patients usually require treatment as long as the condition persists and they remain on immunosuppressive treatment. Patients are at risk of cytomegalovirus due to chronic GVHD so they should have regular blood tests to monitor this and treatment started if CMV is reactivated. Prophylaxis against pneumonia should be administered to all patients undergoing treatment for chronic GVHD for six months after stopping immunosuppressive drugs. Just as we have a grading system for acute graft versus host disease, there are also grading systems um, for grading chronic graft versus host disease. And again, they um, really relate to severity of the patient's symptoms in terms of um, uh, skin involvement, gut involvement and liver involvement and the severity with which each of those three organs is um, affected. Um, the main drugs used for chronic GVHD are in fact very similar to those used in the acute setting. Um, these would include cyclosporine, uh, prednisolone, mycophenolate, sirolimus and tacrolimus. Good morning. You've got some cyclosporine to pick up. Um, and the dose that you're on currently is... Yeah. The mildest grades, grade one and two, are normally respond to steroid therapy. Some patients with more advanced disease, grade three or four, will also respond to steroid therapy, but the major problem is patients who have steroid refractory GVHD. Treating them is still a major challenge. Photophoresis is also being developed as a successful treatment for chronic GVHD, which is unresponsive to steroids. Photophoresis is a process where the T cells in the blood are removed and exposed to a UVA sensitizing drug, 
then treated with an ultraviolet light which causes T-cell death. This limits the GVHD process. Um, have you got any rashes anywhere? Effective assessment supports accurate and timely diagnosis of chronic GVHD, which can enable successful treatment. You, you have to be careful and just check your patient day to day, monitor the, any special change that your patient may be, may be having. But I think with experience, working with patients is easier to identify early signs of GVHD. It looks like large, As with acute so GVHD, it's dry, important to encourage patients to keep their skin clean and well moisturised. Patients yes. with restricted movement often say... benefit from a regular exercise programme and deep muscle massage, protective eyeglasses and sunglasses, as well as frequent lubrication with ophthalmic ointment at night may also help eye symptoms. In addition, monitoring weight loss and gastrointestinal symptoms is essential. Antacid medications may help to relieve the symptoms of esophageal chronic GVHD, or in more serious cases, periodic endoscopic dilations may be required. Consultation with the patient is important where treatments such as the effective use of steroid hormones for vaginal chronic GVHD and mechanical or surgical dilation are necessary for the relief of symptoms. Advice on this distressing symptom is essential and it may be necessary to refer to a gynaecology specialist. Given that many patients undergoing an allogeneic transplant will experience some degree of GVHD, patients should be given a detailed explanation of this before the transplant happens. It's vital that patients are told that there are many different degrees of GVHD, that it can be mild, moderate or severe and that death, disfigurement or permanent disability is unusual. Patients should also be told that there's a fine balance between the damaging effects of GVHD and the beneficial effect of the graft versus tumour effect. Well, I think patient, many patients understand that chronic GVHD in their limited uh, uh, manifestations is a, a, may be an advantage in terms of preventing disease relapse. But of course, then at the same time, they have to cope with the stresses and, uh, and, and the, the consequences of living with that, those problems, which can affect the quality of life significantly. The patients may be on quite a lot of medication um, and they may have impaired uh, function uh, of, of, for example, their eyes with troublesome eye problems or oral problems or cutaneous problems, which can affect their quality of life. So it's a kind of mixed blessing. A little bit of chronic GVHD can be coped with, but if it's, if it's severe, uh, and, uh, then it can be significantly impair the quality of life for patients. The future, I think, is, is, is we need better we need a better understanding of uh, the mechanisms underlying the development of both acute and chronic GVHD, and the mechanisms are different. We need better ways of preventing acute GVHD or preventing severe acute GVHD. We've been using the same drugs for, for 20 years now, cyclosporin, often combined with methotrexate. Uh, these, are, these are effective drugs, but still patients develop as, uh, are at risk of developing acute GVHD. And I think once we, we also need better treatments, particularly for steroid refractory disease, where the, where, where, which is the greatest problem at the moment. Aims in the future are to make the transplant more efficient. And by saying this, we want to provide the cells that only mediate grad versus leukemia, that recognize the tumor, without recognizing the other targets that might lead to grad versus host disease and also provide cells that might provide immune protection, for instance, against virus such as cytomegalovirus. So the optimal transplant will be that one that will have only the right cells and will remove the wrong cells, the ones that might mediate grad versus host disease. I, I think one of the um, challenges of, of graft versus host disease is because here you have a condition um, that's caused by the treatment and it can have long-term um, side effects on a physical level, a psychological level, a social level and indeed a spiritual level and affects the patient and the family. Now alongside this, uh, these side effects we also need to know that this can lead to death but we also know that it can have a benefit effect and I would believe that this is one area of transplant that nurses can take a real lead on 
working very closely with the medical colleagues, with other members of the transplant team, not only to address the physical aspects of this, this condition or this disease, but actually to address those emotional and those social issues and indeed those spiritual issues that sometimes in the transplant world get pushed to the side.